Well, my watch says it's uh, two minutes past the hour, so I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, so uh, welcome to this invited session. This is for uh, Distinguished Scientific Contributions Award winner, Herman Aguinness, who's joined us here today. So grateful that he is here, um, and we're looking forward to his uh, his comments and, and his thoughts on a variety of questions. Uh, I'm Joe Allen. I'm, I'm the host, I guess you could say, and uh, Sarah uh, Ely is here uh, assisting as an administrator uh, for this session. Uh, a couple of uh, uh, housekeeping things. Uh, if, if for during the, the, the session, until we get to the question and answer portion, if you have a question, go ahead and put it in the chat. We'll be keeping track of that so that way we can ask those questions later. Several of your, uh, of, you know, of your questions might be answered throughout the, the session, so, but please uh, put your questions in the chat so that way we can continue uh, throughout the session and get to those at the end. Um, so let me go ahead and introduce uh, this wonderful, amazing person, which is uh, Dr. Herman Aguinness. And, all, and I'll give you a few of the highlights. Sarah's going to put in the chat the link to his bio and his website because there's so much that he's done over the years. So first off, Herman Aguinness, he's the um, Avram de Tucker Distinguished Scholar, Professor of Management, and Chairperson of the Department of Management at, at uh, the George Washington University School of Business. Uh, he has been elected for the presidency track at the Academy of Management served as vice president and program chair for the Academy of Management 2020 virtual conference and is serving as the AOM president-elect, president and past president during the 2020-2023 cycle. Uh, the 2020-2019 and 2018 Web of Science highly cited researchers uh, reports ranked him as one of the top 100 most impactful researchers in, eco in economics and business. Uh, his, work, his work has received more than 36,000 citations. I'm sure that number keeps going up, and so it might be more than that now. <laughs> he has an H index of 88, so his, his research has, is everywhere, and I think many of us have cited it. Uh, his research is interdisciplinary by nature and addresses the acquisition and deployment of talent in organizations and organizational research methods. Um, I have, if I can grab it here real quick, I have one of his books on my shelf here that I studied in graduate school. Uh, this is actually the third edition. I think the new one actually may have a different cover, but so he, he's published nine books, including this one on performance management. Uh, he's had 180 rough read publications, 50 book chapters and monographs, 300 keynotes and presentations at conferences, 160 invited presentations, over $5 million uh, in, re in revenue generated for his, for his research and teaching endeavors. Uh, he's, he's a fellow of uh, half a dozen different <laughs> societies and, 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 and groups at this point. Uh, he's been a, a, a reviewer and editor and editor-in-chief on a variety of journals. Uh, and he has, uh, in addition to his academic activities, he's also uh, consulted with organizations in, in the United States, in Europe, and Latin America, including the United Nations, uh, Accenture, the city of San Francisco Police Department, Kronos. Uh, the, the list just goes on and on and on, which is, makes sense. Uh, we have our, a distinguished scientific, scientific uh, contributions award winner right here with us. So uh, very excited to have you here, uh, Herman. And so today, uh, what we did, uh, or actually what Herman did and we did together uh, leading up to this is we actually uh, crowdsourced uh, the, uh, the, the questions uh, by asking the, the uh, members of social media and members of, of, of PSYOP to submit their questions for consideration for asking uh, Herman uh, about his career, about his experiences, and we've organized those. And so I'm gonna basically ask him questions uh, that will kind of guide us through his experiences over the course of his career. And then as questions come up from, for, as he's answering his, the questions, please enter, in the, enter those in the chat. So that way uh, we can be sure to, to learn from someone who has uh, been so successful so far and uh, likely will be continue to be successful through the many years uh, to come. So with that, I'm gonna stop talking, sort of, and ask the first question. So the first question comes from Patricia Martinez de Sanchez from Loyola Mount, Marymount University. And she asked, um, I remember reading a piece that you wrote many, many years back for PSYOPS publication, where you talked about your younger years and some of the challenges your family faced in Argentina. I think I it would be great to give folks a sliver of that phase of your life. So tell, tell us a little bit about that time of your life and and the challenges that you experienced. Thank you, Joe, for your kind words. And definitely this takes us to the very beginning, I guess. <laughs> um, yeah. Thank you and welcome everyone. It's so good to see so many friends here today. And we're really dealing with Zoom all day long. So we thought we would do this question and answer format, which probably will be more interesting than just the talking head uh, for 50 minutes. 
Uh, first of all, I'd like to tell you how honored I am by this award. Uh, it means a great deal to me. When I received the email from SIAP, the first thing I did is I went to the SIAP website. And when I saw the list of names of people who received the award in the past, I was just so humbled and honored because these are my intellectual heroes. And some of you are here today in this session. Thank you for joining us. And to be part of that group uh, really means a great deal. So thank you, thank you so much. Back to your question about my childhood, I was uh, born and raised in Argentina. And as some of you may, may know, in Argentina in the 1970s, there was a, a dictatorship. There was a, an authoritarian regime. And it's a very unique experience, something very different from what we see in the United States. For example, there's no freedom of the press. Uh, there's no voting. There's no Congress. The, the justice system is not independent from the executive branch. If you say something that the government doesn't like, you can be literally kidnapped and never seen again. And in fact, there is a word for that, the desaparecidos, the disappeared ones. The term means that you were kidnapped because you disagreed with government policies and you were vocal about that and never, you've never seen, been seen again. So think about growing up in a place like that. And then I came to the United States when I was 13 and I'm watching TV and I hear people argue with each other on political issues and criticizing the government and having different religious perspectives. And I would read the newspaper and also see very different opinions. And to me, that, that was very foreign and it was fabulous. And I just couldn't believe it. Um, coming from a place where you could literally be kidnapped and disappeared if you disagreed with the government view. So growing up in Argentina, I believe, in a dictatorship, gave me a very different perspective on our rights and obligations as citizens and um, our privilege in terms of being able to vote. So I vote everywhere. I vote in my in PSYOP, of course, but I vote in the APA elections. I vote, I vote for the HOA, like the Homeowners <laughs> Association. I vote every single time. Every chance I get to vote, I vote. The other thing that really shaped my, my life and my, my career is speaking up because I could not speak up when I was young, when I was a teenager going back to Argentina. And so I do speak up. And when I see that something doesn't feel right, that, that someone is being wronged, or I see an injustice, or I see something that I think is not quite right, I, I tend to speak up. And, and to be frank, I've gotten in trouble with, with people in power sometimes because I do speak up uh, when I feel that there is power abuse and, and misuse. And I truly believe that our experiences shape who we are as researchers and practitioners. So that is the origin, I believe, uh, of my interest in fairness and justice, uh, my desire to have a positive impact on organizations and society and the well being of individuals. I think those early experiences really shaped who I am, the work I do, the research I do, and my entire perspective on the impact of audio psychology. Uh, on a broader on a broader level. That's great. Thanks, thanks, Herman. That, and that's fascinating uh, history there and 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 uh, experiences that you've had. Uh, so, from Alan Roth, uh, formerly at the Peace Corps, uh, he says, "I know that you are a dedicated father and husband, plus keeping in touch with a very large extended family, um, all of which, uh, of course, takes time. Uh, but I have to ask how you can produce so many innovative papers, write books, be a leader of an international professional association." Uh, lead their annual meeting, teach and really care for your students and sleep. <laughs> so assuming that you actually get a chance to sleep, that's the real question. How do you do it? How do you do all these things uh, and still function as a human being? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Alan. And uh, I, I have to say that I would not have uh, the successful career that I have now without the support and love of my wife, uh, my wife, Heidi, who is my best friend and my soulmate. And Heidi has a PhD in religious and psychological studies. She's a therapist in private practice. And we are partners in everything we do, uh, including managing our household and raising our two daughters, Hannah and Naomi. And frankly, we do have a very full and very, very busy life with uh, two teenage daughters in the house. 
but we have a lot of fun together. And one of the things I do is not to separate work and family. I try to integrate those things. Um, for example, uh, every time I've had a sabbatical, uh, the first sabbatical, which we call BC, that's before children, uh, we, Heidi and I spent half a year in Asia. Uh, in China, in Singapore, Hong Kong. Um, we went to Thailand, Malaysia. It was wonderful. And Heidi was doing some work remotely. I was doing my work there. Um, and then we've had sabbaticals uh, later with the kids. And we took the kids for half a year uh, to Spain, a full year to Spain, and then Puerto Rico. Our daughters went to school there, full immersion in Spanish, uh, which was great. So we have truly fantastic memories of all of these adventures. And the way I do it is not by separating, but, but by integrating family and work as much as I can. Great. Uh, so transitioning a little bit now from your, your background and, and, and family experience, but to your professional journey, um, Oscar Holmes from Rutgers University uh, asked the question, what would you say has been your most impactful research project to date uh, not necessarily based on the usual like, academy standards of impact, you know, number of citations, et cetera. Um, so what was the most impactful and, and why? Thank you. Thank you, Oscar. And I think that's a very good uh, point. Um, first of all, in terms of measuring your impact in other ways, in, in ways that affect other stakeholders, uh, not just academics, but students, practitioners, uh, policymakers, um, uh, consultants, managers. In terms of impact, I think it's really hard to have impact based on just one individual study or one individual article. I think we need to think about impact of research streams. And Joe just showed uh, the cover of the third edition of my, uh, my performance management book. And, and that, I think that was a good indicator of impact. Joe said, hey, he wrote this book and I like it and I use it in my classes, there you go. So, so that is an indicator of impact, that you're having impact on students, you're having impact on future managers who are taking that class. So I would say performance management is that one research stream. We have published, of course, several articles in journals on the topic, but also uh, I wrote that textbook. And last year, I felt that performance management is such a hot topic right now that I wanted to reach out to an even broader audience. And, and I was thinking about this and of course consulted my, with my wife, Heidi, my, my best friend and, and soulmate. And she said, why don't you write a book for dummies in the For Dummies series? And, and I thought, wow, that, don't you think that's like dumbing down the topic? And she said, no, if you really want to have impact on a very broad audience, that's, that's a way to do it. So I reached out to the, to the dummies uh, publisher, that's Wiley, and then, they love the idea. And so last year I wrote a, a book titled Performance Manager for Dummies. And I have received so many emails, uh, press releases and interviews from practitioners uh, based on that book. And, uh, and, and recently there was a, a review published in Personal Psychology of that book, which is quite nice. And when people ask me, I say the dummies part does not apply to the reader. It applies to the author. So don't worry about it. But I tell you, it's been a very difficult thing to write that book uh, because we're not trained to write in a very prescriptive manner. The, the dummies book, I had to say, these are the 10 things that you must do or you will fail. And these are the 10 things that you should not do. Uh, but but it's, a, it's, a, it's a very interesting way to reach out. And I think we need more of that in terms of training our doctoral students on how to write and communicate better with, with much broader audiences. So I would say performance management is that stream that I, I believe has had quite a bit of impact outside of the traditional academic circles. Great, thanks, Herman. Um, so the, the, the next question, uh, building on that to some degree is from Liberty Munson uh, from Microsoft uh, Worldwide. She says, which research product do you think had the most impact on the scientific community? So there's first the impactful research project to date. And I think you, you mentioned your, your books, but also the, 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 the recent one. Um, but in this case, what particular project uh, felt like impacted the, the scientific community and, and why? That's, thank you, Liberty. That's another good question. And again, I would refer to research stream rather than one particular study or project. 
And we, and I say we because of course research is not done by one person anymore. So I'm very, very thankful to my current and former doctoral students and all my colleagues with whom I've worked uh, for so long to produce uh, this research. Um, we have worked on, on many domains, corporate social responsibility, fairness and testing, star performers, methodological issues, interactions. But if I have to say, what would be one stream that's, that's really impacted a lot of researchers, I would say those are our papers on best practices uh, in terms of methodology. Um, we have uh, written many, many papers on how to do things right in terms of uh, meta-analytic structure question modeling, control variables, outliers, data transformations, data cleaning, mechanical Turk, interviews, and, and many other issues. And let me, let me tell you a secret uh, about how this got started. Uh, about 10 years ago, I got a review from a journal and a reviewer said, you're doing things wrong from a methodological standpoint. And we felt the reviewer was wrong. And we explained why we were right and the reviewer was not right. But it was the reviewer's word against our word. Well, guess who won? The reviewer won. We got our paper rejected. So I talked to other colleagues and I, and I asked them, what do you do when you face something like that? That a reviewer tells you that you have to do something the wrong way and you don't want to do it. And, and my colleagues are saying, well, we typically, we have to cite a source that, that supports your point of view. And I said, well, for many of these issues, like the ones I just mentioned, control variables, outliers, there are many ways of doing things. And it's not, it is not clear what's the best way to do it. And I thought maybe we should write a paper that sets the record straight. So selfishly, I will be able to cite that paper the next time I get a reviewer who challenges that practice. And I will say, that paper in organizational research methods, that paper in general management says that this is how you should do it. And this is why we did it that way. So we started down that path. And I have to tell you, uh, I think that has been very, very, very well received. And it's been very useful. So when you think about impact, going back to Oscar's question and Liberty's question about impact, I think impact is related to usefulness. If something that you do is useful, it will have impact. So performance management is certainly useful for practitioners. They have to manage the performance of their employees. So that was influential for practitioners. And for researchers, what do you do as a researcher? You do research. And what is useful to, do, to you? Tools to do research, methods. So if you produce a prescriptive papers on how to do research right, I think that has great potential to have an impact on, on that particular group of stakeholders. That's great, Herman. It made me think of, you know, you write something now, so that way it enables you to write something later. That's, that's, that's pretty cool. I, I like that. Um, next question for what was, and I apologize, I'm reading, reading people's names, and I'm, and I know I'm probably not going to say them right. So uh, if they're, if they're on, on the call, you can correct me if they're not, if they're not on here. Um, I'm sure they'll, they'll listen to this later and, and, and shake their head. But anyway, uh, Makeba Massey at Jackson State University University uh, asks, how do you face failure? Uh, and do, do you even fail? <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see how, you know, from a methodological perspective, the construct failure, we need to define it, right? And I don't know about you, but I get my papers rejected all the time. And I get my grant proposals rejected all the time. But I do not consider those failures. Um, these are challenges. I consider these challenges. Uh, a failure is not when you get your paper rejected, but what do you do with that? Do you fix the paper and then send it back to another journal? Then that's not a failure. It's a learning moment. It's an opportunity for you to improve your work. So I would change for some of you who are thinking that failure is to have your paper rejected or your proposal rejected, I would change that definition of failure because that is not failure. That is an opportunity to improve your work. It's a challenge and we all face challenges. Now, those challenges are part of the DNA of our profession. That is how science moved forward. Self, we have self-correction. You do something, you may not be quite right. Somebody else tells you how to do it better. You get feedback, you improve and you move forward. Now, it doesn't mean it is not hurtful. When you get that rejection letter, it can be quite hurtful. But the more we understand 
that these rejections are not failures and they are absolutely normal. They are part of our industry. The less hurtful they will be and the more we will be able to learn from those experiences. Great, yeah. The uh, I, I'm glad you mentioned that that you you also receive rejections and and that sort of thing. I think that's uh, a common misconception of those who are really really successful that they no longer get rejected, but the reality is uh, they they just keep at it. Um, so that's great. Uh, that next question was uh, from uh, Tanusri Jane at uh, Trinity College in Dublin. Uh, they asked the question, how to avoid burnout in academia? So how Great do you avoid burnout, Herman? <laughs> Great to receive a, a question from Ireland, too. Um, so the nice thing about many of these questions is that we actually have research in either psychology that help us understand uh, how, to, how to answer those questions. In, in the case of burnout, uh, my, one of my doctoral students now, Kelly Gabriel, and I just published an article in Business Horizons, and the title is, let me look it up, it's uh, How to Prevent and Combat Employee Burnout and Create Healthier Workplaces During Crisis and Beyond. So in that paper in Business Horizons, we review the literature and about what we know about burnout and how can we use, how can we use it for organizational interventions. And so we can use our own research to answer this question. And for example, we know that exercising, having hobbies, spending time with family and friends. These are all the things you can do to minimize uh, burnout. The other thing that we also know based on our own research is that we have to be active job crafters of our own jobs. We have to be able to sculpt or craft our jobs so that we do things that we're passionate about. Uh, for example, we're very fortunate because in our field, we can do research on the topics that we care about. Uh, typically, we can also teach in the domains that we care about. So by doing things we're passionate about, things we care about, we can minimize um, burnout. So I think overall, the literature is quite clear that you need to find uh, what you love to do and also have a variety of jobs and tasks. And you do those things combined with taking some time off. And that's pretty much the recipe for minimizing burnout. Great, thank you for that. I think uh, uh, in this uh, pandemic year that we've just had and, and, and continue to some degree, I think uh, many of us are looking for answers to that question. So I appreciate that. Uh, so the next question was from Sabine from Brueggemann, uh, it's just, uh, works at uh, Learning Illustrated. She says, uh, have you ever been taken aside by someone else that's, that's important in the field uh, with the hint, uh, you know, Herman, we don't really talk about or publish stuff like this. I mean, this is just not what we do. Have you ever had that happen? And, and what was that experience like? Yes. Hello, Sabine. Sabine, actually, I believe is based in Vienna. So good to hear from you, Sabine. This is a, a great question. And, um, and I don't know if you've heard about uh, Cervantes. Cervantes is the Spanish equivalent of Shakespeare. He lived in the 1500s and he's the author of Don Quixote. And there's a story that is attributed to Cervantes in Don Quixote, but I believe uh, that it's not in the Don Quixote. It was written afterwards. But essentially, the story goes like this. Don Quixote, which you might, if you read the book, he's riding this huge, very tall uh, horse. He has a sidekick called Sancho, and Sancho is riding a tiny, tiny donkey. And Sancho is a very big man, and he's riding this tiny donkey. And Don Quixote is a very tall and slim man, and he's riding this super a tall horse and, and they're riding along, they're riding along and then they, appro they approach a town at night. And as they're riding to the town, the dogs go crazy and they go, whoa, 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 whoa. They start barking and making tons of noises and, and barking at them, barking at them. And then Sancho becomes very concerned and says, Don Quixote, Don Quixote, the dogs, the dogs are barking. Don Quixote uh, turns around and, and looks at Sancho and says very calmly and says, Sancho, my friend, don't worry. Yes, the dogs are barking. This is a sign that we have been seen. So in our field, I've had a lot of barking <laughs> directed at me and our research because when you're doing things that hopefully are important, that people care about, people have opinions about those things. And in particular, I have to say our, our recent work on star performers 
uh, that has received a, a lot of subsequent research that, that has uh, engaged in a conversation with our research, but that doesn't concern me, it doesn't concern us. It makes us actually happy. I think the worst that could possibly happen is that you do research and nobody says anything about it. Nobody cares. Uh, you get no reaction. Because why do we do research? We do research so that people can read that research and benefit from that research. And that's why we publish the research. Otherwise, we wouldn't publish it. We would just do the research and, and not do anything with it. The fact that we publish the research is because we want someone else to read it. So yes, we've had a lot of, uh, a lot of barking directed at us. But the way we think about it is we let them bark and we ride on. And that's the way to do it. And we're happy that people pay attention to our work. Yeah, that's great. I think uh, many of us have had had moments uh, or uh, like that. Uh, and so that's a great, great story and great example. Um, so uh, looking, transitioning to another kind of broad topic here, kind of career advice uh, for junior or mid-career scholars, uh, myself included, uh, several questions here. Uh, Michaela Massey, again, at Jackson State uh, asks, how do you successfully identify mentors or scholars to collaborate with? Great, thank you, Maquiba. And this is another example of using our own research. So we have a very large um, amount of research in IO psychology and personal selection. So we can use that theory and that research to select a mentor. So how do you select a mentor? How do you select a person to be your mentor? So what do we know from our personal selection literature? First of all, you think about the job of a mentor, right? A little job description. We will create the, the list of KSAs. What are the knowledge, skills, and abilities that a successful mentor uh, should have? So for example, you would say, well, it, it should be someone who has published with doctoral students in the past, if you're a doctoral student looking for a mentor. Um, so you create that list of KSAs, and then the next step in the personnel selection uh, literature would say, you do some kind of assessment, collect some data to see who of your applicants has those KSAs. So if you're a doctoral student and you're looking around your department, you look at the faculty in your department and you look at their research records and you look at their citations and publications and research domains and activities and involvement in professional organizations and, and how many of them have published with doctoral students, have chaired uh, doctoral dissertations, and that's your data, your assessment in terms of uh, who would be a good mentor for you. So you can essentially select your mentor using the same theory uh, and approaches that we use in our own personal selection uh, research. Great. Um, so as a, as a kind of a follow-up to that to some degree, uh, Jose Ferrero Pinto at uh, University of Macau asks, uh, what was the key characteristic of your co-authors that you prize the most? That is, uh, and what, what makes them you know, outstanding from your point of view as a collaborator? Thank you, Jose. And Jose has a very Portuguese name, Jose Ferreira Pinto, and he's out of Macau. And some of you may know Macau used to be a Portuguese colony. And uh, when I visited Macau many years ago, I went to that fantastic, fantastic Portuguese restaurant uh, in, in, uh, in Macau, which was fabulous, authentic Portuguese food there. And Jose, I would answer this question in the same way I answered the previous question with, with our own personnel selection uh, research and theory. So as a co-author, what are the KSAs of a co-author? So I would think number one, when the co-author says they will deliver a, a write-up or analysis or some kind of product, they, they do that on time and they do it well. Uh, do they keep their promises? Are they timely? Um, so again, I would just think about the, the KSAs that you are looking for in a co-author. For example, if you're putting together a team and that co-author needs to be the methods specialist, or somebody who knows the domain, how do you measure whether that person has those KSAs? And you can do that and then you select the person based on the KSAs. So I think it's a wonderful um, wonderful way to apply uh, our own knowledge. We say there's a, a researcher or science practice divide, right? That the practitioners are not using the research that we produce in IO psychology. But even within our field, I think we can benefit ourselves based on using our own research 
for our own practices. How do you put together teams of researchers? How do you select a mentor? How do you select a co-author? We can use our own research and selection uh, to make those kinds of decisions. That's great. Uh, so uh, next question was from Samantha Erskine at Case Western uh, University. Uh, she asks, how do you structure your days or weeks for reading and writing and thinking and data? So how do you manage your time rela in relation to these tasks that we many of us have to do in order to be successful in the scientific uh, endeavors? I think you just need to find your mojo. I, I am a, I'm a morning person, so I get up very early. Uh, work for a couple hours, then have breakfast with, with my wife and kids, and then back to work. And unless I have to, I try to not teach in the mornings and try to not schedule meetings in the morning. Like today, we have a morning meeting. It is, I, I don't have control. But those are the hours for me that are most productive. So you need to find your, your time when you can do your, your best work. And also related to that, uh, let's I mentioned using personnel selection to choose a mentor and to choose co-authors. We can use our own performance management research to manage our own performance. So do you have a, a personal development plan? Do you have a plan with goals for this month, for this semester, for a year, for two years, for three years? Um, many assistant professors think, oh, I have such a huge runway. I have seven years until I'm reviewed for tenure. Uh, so you might want to think about creating your own personal development plan based on the performance, lit performance management literature to set some goals along the way. And that also has, has worked for me. If you think about companies, organizations, most of them have strategic plans to manage their goals, to manage their performance. And I think we should also individually have our own plans and that would be very helpful for us. That's great. Uh, so uh, Tanusri Jane uh, has a follow-up question um, asking you, know, what would be your advice to earlier mid-career uh, researchers on how to be productive as a researcher, uh, on research impact, and on research collaborations? What, what's your, your, you know, your advice? So the, the issue of research impact is, is a very interesting thing. and We have a lot of conversations going on. And in 2014, we published a paper in Academic Management, Learning and Education, expanding the concept of impact. And it's, a, it's based on stakeholder theory. And essentially, uh, the paper says that if you want to have impact on a particular stakeholder, you need to understand their needs and do things that are useful to them. So for example, if you want to have an impact on undergrads and undergraduate education, maybe writing a paper in JAP is not going to give you that kind of impact. If you want to have an impact on undergraduate education, you probably need to write a textbook. I mean, teaching obviously is good because as you teach students, you're having an impact on them, but you will have an impact on a few hundred students every year. If you write a textbook, you can have an impact on thousands of students. If you want to have um, uh, an impact on practitioners, then maybe you need to write papers that practitioners read. So. Before I talked about a personal development plan in terms of your, in terms of your research career, uh, in a paper we just published in Business and Society, again, as you can see, some of these journals are not journals in which IO psychologists typically publish. And, and, and that's by design because these are journals that are read by, by lots of managers and, and broader audiences. In this article in Business and Society, we offer a new concept, the concept of the personal impact development plan. So it's a plan that you can implement to think about your goals in terms of impact. Who do you want to impact? Do you want to impact other researchers? Well, then, then yes, you have to publish in top tier journals. You have to look at your citations, your H index and so forth. Great. Now, do you want to have impact on, uh, on practitioners? Then maybe you need to do other things. Uh, you need to be active in social media and uh, you want to post your research on LinkedIn and in a way that people will understand. You might want to set up a blog. Uh, you want to have impact on students. Like I said before, you might want to write a textbook. Now, can you do all these things at the same time? Probably not. Probably you cannot do it all, but maybe you can do some of these things at different stages in your career. And that's related to not getting burnout. Uh, this is related to doing things that you're passionate about. And those things might change over time. So maybe at the initial stage of your career, you're focusing on having an impact on research and theory and publishing your top tier publications. 
And then as you progress, maybe you want to become, do some, some administrative work, be more involved in professional organizations. So you have a leadership role and you have impact on different kinds of stakeholders, but this is not happening automatically. You really need to sit down and have your own plan. And this is what we propose, the personal impact development plan. And we have a template, we have a figure you can actually use to check boxes and see uh, in five years from now, in three years from now, six months from, from now, who would you like to have impact on and how are you going to get there? And also in that template, we include what kinds of skills and abilities you might need to be able to reach that level of impact. Because like I said earlier, many of us were not trained to communicate or write for broader audiences. So the, the skills are really critical as well. Great, I like that. The identifying the who do you want to get your information, get your research, get your your uh, your ideas out to, and then based on that, you know, building a strategy. I, I love that. That's what that's uh, great. Great advice. Uh, advice that I wish I had had um, early career, but as a, as a mid career professional, uh, definitely going to take it. So, uh, next question uh, was from uh, Lee Hong at. Uh, Li Huang, sorry, um, at Auburn University. I'm, I'm probably not saying that right either. I apologize, Lee. Um, what particular research topics do you think uh, would be most helpful addressing the changing nature of work design and the leadership styles needed to accommodate um, the post-pandemic era? Interesting, interesting uh, topic for sure. And going back to the issue I talked about, which is doing research you're passionate about, um, you have to balance your passion with what's interesting and important to other people as well. Because otherwise it might be very hard to get your research published. So I think in terms of identifying topics, it's good to scan the environment um, and understand what are the topics that people care about, but also follow your passion and follow something that, because you will get these rejections from journals. And the only way to, to not quit that marathon is to be able to have that stamina that you get from doing something you really care about. But without being naive in the sense that if you're studying some, something that nobody else cares about, you might not be able to get it published. It's a, it's, a, it's a fine balance of finding what you're passionate about and kind of what are the needs of the market in terms of knowledge that needs to be generated. Great. Um, so kind of transitioning to uh, personal questions, if that's okay. Um, Jose. Uh, oh, it depends. Let's see where you go, Joe. Let's yeah. See. Well, <laughs> these are these are other people's questions. I have my oh, own. Okay, okay, good, good. good, good okay, later, okay. But, um, so uh, Jose asks, uh, what sports uh, you practice uh, and how it helped uh, you recently and before, you know, what, what sports are, are of interest to you and, and how has that helped you in your career to some degree? Sure. So when I was young, I was I was into martial arts quite a bit, Taekwondo, and I participated in tournaments, uh, regional, state, and national tournaments. Um, of course, now with my age, if I if I try to do those kicks, I will pull my hamstring in a second. So I don't do that anymore. Uh, so what I do is I I run, I lift weights, and I try to exercise uh, four or five diet four four or five times every week. And and because the mornings are my my writing time, I typically do it in the in the evening. Uh, like before dinner or late afternoon. Another thing that I do is I love music. Uh, I love to uh, play music, listen to music. And when I was younger, I used to play the piano mostly. And when I was a teenager, I transitioned to drums uh, because I was in a band and we didn't have a drummer. <laughs> so we did a drummer. And I said, that sounds cool. And, uh, and so I, I, I transitioned to, uh, to drums and uh, I've had many, many bands over the years and one band uh, that some of you may have uh, heard about because we brag about it is the Karma Band, the, the Karma Band, the Center for Applied Research Methods and Analysis Band. Uh, and this includes uh, my dear friends, uh, Jeff Edwards from UNC who plays guitar, Jeff Stanton from Syracuse who plays the bass and Larry Williams from Texas Tech who's our producer and also sings. And what we would do is after the Karma uh, workshops in which we would teach statistics and methods for two and a half days. We would get together in a local bar, bring our, our gear and sit up and play for two or three hours um, and, and put on like tank tops and t-shirts. And I just remember uh, one of those times, and of course, you know, we get sweaty, we're playing classic rock. And then uh, one of the students who had participated in my stats class for two and a half days approached me and said, Dr. Guinness, 
you look different, <laughs> she said to me. <laughs> I surely did. But yeah, that music is, is something close to my heart that helped you quite a bit. Great. Um, as a reminder, please uh, put your, your questions in the chat. I have one more and then I'll, I'll then we'll start answering those questions. So if you have questions, whether it be on, on the topics we've already kind of hit and you want more on those things or whether there's other questions, please put them in the chat and we'll we'll start doing those just in, in just a second. So last question, um, another personal question. Um, Samantha Erskine asks, um, how and when do you engage in self-care? I think you were starting to describe some of that with uh, with the band and such, but how do you do that? And when do you engage in that self-care that's that's necessary for our well-being? Every day, every day, because I just love my job. What can I say? I, I love to do research. I love to teach. I love to interact with, with students outside of the classroom. I like to also speak to practitioners and how to improve their practices. I love to attend PSYOP. This is self-care to me, to listen to the opening um, session this morning was fantastic to, to learn about all the wonderful things going in our profession, uh, to learn about other people's research. That is very interesting to me. That's very motivating. That's all part of self-care. These are things that I would do and I do without getting paid. So what are the things that, that I do that I would do anyway? Uh, the research, the teaching, most of the things I do, I'm very lucky. I'm a very, very lucky person because I found my passion. I found that this profession is, is terrific for me. So I think that every day I engage in self-care. Great. Uh, so go, going to the chat, the first question that I that I received was um, from Joel uh, Weisson or Weisson. I apologize, Joel. Um, you could correct me if you'd like. <laughs> but uh, how might IO psychologists be able to help improve the job performance of police officers and police departments? So maybe thinking about some of the recent news we've been we've been uh, hearing about and reading about. Um, what would be your thoughts on how IO psychology could help in that way, in that area? Well, I, I feel very humble here because I see many of, of my, my heroes and colleagues here in this call who have worked with police departments for decades, like Wayne Castle, for example, right here, who worked with the, with the police department in the city of Chicago for decades. So I wouldn't dare, I wouldn't dare to offer advice to, to, to people here in this call, but I would go back to the basics, Joel, and it's good to hear from you and see you. We've been friends for many years. Uh, if, you, if you look at the basic uh, theories and research from IO psychology in terms of job analysis, uh, training, uh, training and development, promotion systems, it's all there. So I think the key is not so much what we need to know, but how we apply it. So how can we transfer all the knowledge and the theories that we have so that practitioners can implement best practices based on the base, best available research that we have. The research is not the secret. I think that the challenge is how to transfer that. And we need more people like you, Joel, with a PhD in psychology, who's out there in the trenches, working with police departments on a daily basis. And you're kind of one foot in the research world and one foot in the practitioner world, which is a wonderful thing. So thank you, Joel, for your question and your contribution. Great. Uh, so uh, next question from uh, Pratiba Deepak asks, uh, what are the research skills, analytical or research methods uh, you recommend IO doctoral students should definitely take now that maybe maybe they didn't they didn't have in the past? I don't know. But what would you recommend there? So that's that's a very, very good question. I, and as a doctoral student, of course, I would start with a basic and fundamental uh, general linear model, because if you start with that, uh, template, that foundational knowledge, you can go from there to uh, meta-analysis, you can go from there to uh, structured question modeling, you can go to multi-level modeling. Um, that, that's one foundational thing. The other foundational thing is the tools, the software tools that we use. Um, and again, foundational things like R, for example, and now we see Python as well. Um, R, uh, interestingly, is, is similar to uh, matrix programming in Lisrael when I started learning Lisrael almost 30 years ago, before we had the pull-down menus, which are fantastic. I, I love them. That that's, it makes life easier. But to really be on the cutting edge of, met cutting edge of methods is very important in addition to the foundation, because when you learn new methods, you can ask new questions that you couldn't even think about before. For example, with the advent of multi-level modeling, now you can ask questions such as, what are, what are the influences of a team on an individual and the influences of an individual on the team? So 
What are the downward and upward influences in an organization? And if you're not uh, conversant with uh, multi -mo multi level modeling, you wouldn't even ask that question. You would just stay within a single uh, level framework. So I think it's really important to first deal with the foundational things and then move on to the cutting edge because there's a clear take, uh, give and take between theory and method. New theories uh, say we need to test certain hypotheses and you will need to develop new methods to test those. But learning new methods will allow you to ask very new and interesting questions that will advance theory. Great, and I, I think for a, a kind of a, a final question here uh, for Herman if, before we wrap up, so we could be uh, cognizant of time, um, would be you know we we, we know you you've done so much in your in your career. We know that you're going to be uh, uh, president of Academy Management. Uh, you're in that cycle, that process. Um, what would you say? What what are the next steps for for you in in your career? What what what's the big thing you're working on, or the next thing that you want to do that maybe you would like you could share with us. The next thing is what I'm working on today. <laughs> and tomorrow, the next thing will be the thing I'm working on tomorrow. So right now, um, I am working with my students on several projects on corporate social responsibility, on star performance, on methods, integrating micro with macro research. And also lately, we have been working on integrating qualitative with quantitative methods. Uh, qualitative methods are not very popular in IO psychology, so we're integrating those with quantitative. And the other thing we're working on is transparency, replicability, and how to improve the credibility and trustworthiness of our research. Uh, again, when we complain about researchers not using our work, um, it is very hard to uh, put pressure on them and tell them to use our work when we try to replicate our research and we're not able to replicate our research. Uh, so I think replicability is something that is coming. It's something we need to look at. Uh, I, I do like very much many of the changes in journal policies that I've seen in terms of double checking the statistics, making data available. And at the end of the day, why do we do research? It needs to help someone other than ourselves. Now there's nothing wrong with adding citations and publications to our vita because we get tenure, we get promotion and we get all nice nice things, we want that. But there's nothing wrong with doing good and doing well. Those, those two things go together. So let's do high quality, high rigorous, highly rigorous research that also is useful and has an impact on society that enhances individual well-being and also helps improve organizational performance. I do not see those things as mutually exclusive. In fact, I believe that by integrating them, we can have our biggest and, and most um, effective impact not only on other researchers, but also on practitioners and society at large. Great, thank you for that. Thank you, thank you for answering all these questions. Uh, that's all the questions, there aren't any additional questions in the chat. So I wanna thank everyone for being here today. I think we're right at time. Uh, so unless there's other questions, someone so, you know, un, you know, unmute themselves and yell something out, I think we're gonna call it good. And thank you, Herman, for, for being here for, and, and we celebrate your successes uh, and for the winning, the winning this award this year. It's such a uh, honor to have you in our, in our midst today and to be a, a colleague of, 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 of so many great people that are here on the call, so. Thank you so much. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Wayne, Rich, Ed, Milt. Uh, I see everyone, Joel, Nancy. Thank you so much, David, Constanza, everybody. Thank you so much. It's a great journey. We're just getting started. Yeah. All right. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you later. Enjoy PSYOP. <laughs>